Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me. I am Sarah Buino, host of Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I am feeling super buzzy, super just charged, tuned up after having this amazing conversation with Dr. Miles Neal. And as you'll hear through the conversation, he does such a beautiful job of, we talked about being able to kind of self-promote and do it in an authentic way and not appear narcissistic. And so I am going to use that right now and channel that energy and ask you that if you really enjoy the show, that you share it with other folks. And if you share it with other folks, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts is fantastic. You know, the stars are great, but actually writing something to leave a review is even better. I really am truly honored to be able to share these conversations with you. And I just want to do more. I just want to do more of it. And it's always helpful to know that other people are picking up what I'm putting down. So let me tell you about Dr. Miles Neal. He is among the leading voices of the current generation of Buddhist teachers and a forerunner in the emerging field of contemplative psychotherapy. He's a licensed psychotherapist in private practice, an international speaker, and faculty member of Tibet House U.S. and Wheel Cornell Medical College. He's the author of Gradual Awakening, The Tibetan Buddhist Path of Becoming Fully Human, along with its audio companion of Guided Meditations, The Gradual Path, and that supports the Kopan Nunnery in Nepal. He is also co-editor of the groundbreaking volume Advances in Contemplative Psychotherapy. Miles is based in New York City. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Miles Neal. Hello, Dr. Miles Neal. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yes. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm really excited for this conversation. Well, let's roll because I'm excited too. Yes. So tell the listeners who you are and what you do. I'm a psychotherapist by training. I am also a Buddhist teacher. I have about 23 years plus years right now studying the Tibetan system of mind science and spiritual development. I've been on that path just as a way of sort of discovering the world and navigating Mm -hmm. all the pitfalls of my own life. And then somehow in my history was able to make it a part of my career and part of my calling. So Mm -hmm. that's a long story in and of itself. But but essentially, I live in New York City with my wife and two kids and my little bulldog. And uh, (laughs) I am very, very happy that it's spring and it's time to get some warmth into my life. Yes. In Chicago, we're also very happy, though it's still cold. So but it's coming. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So I heard you on Chris Grasso's podcast and first he just interviewed me recently. I don't think it's come out yet, but he interviewed me and I was like, okay, now I'm going to listen to his show with the intent of like preparing to be interviewed by him. And it was a very big mistake to listen to yours <laughs> because I was like, this guy is so motherfucking smart. I need to talk to him immediately because psychotherapy and Buddhism, like I've been learning more and more about Buddhism lately and don't know enough to call myself a Buddhist or an expert, but it's been transformational in my own life and in my practice. And so I'd love to hear the story of how you did come to combine that in your work. Sure. I find it uncanny at this stage that compliments like I'm very smart. There is still an inner self that feels that's so discordant. I have heard that sometimes. And I have so much shame and so much insecurity Mm. that I just want to be as frank with you. Like, isn't it so hard to receive a compliment? Yes. It's not how I see myself. I have so much admiration for people I find so brilliant and smart. And when I hear that, it's just, it's almost an uncomfortability, but I'm working on it. I'm I'm like saying, there's no reason for you to be disingenuous with me. And so there's a wonderful compliment. And so I'm going to just start at the top here. A, (laughs) being real with you. Thank you. It doesn't fit with me but I will try to take that in. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, it's so funny that literally happened to me this morning with a client who I could tell was like putting me on a pedestal. And so we then talked about that is like, how do we take compliments and how does that help with self-worth and whatnot? So thank you for being so honest about that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I think it's also important for people to see that Mm -hmm. I may be a teacher or a therapist, but on the inside, it's like I got to do the work because I have a long, long history to overcome. And I'm very interested in overcoming it. 
but in no way have I arrived at that place where I'm just like good to go. It's an everyday process. So right. in any event, also no need to belabor it. But if you want to know a little bit about my story, we get it's basically the backstory of why my inner world doesn't feel like it mm-hmm. deserves to have a compliment like that. So let's expand, you know, yeah. so I was born in Singapore and raised in Hong Kong. My father mm-hmm. was a businessman and my mother was a designer from a Levantine or Turkish heritage. Mm. I've told this story over and over again, but then I can do it in a nutshell. It is a story of unabashed opportunity. And we had fortune and we had successes in the family and there was afforded to me every kind of desire that one might want. And yet, probably as early as 13, 14, 15, I found myself in an incredible hole, black hole, a dark hole, what some people in the spiritual world might call the dark night of the soul happened very early for me. And I had no outlets. And I can say this with no compunction is that For all the external resources that were available in my family, we sorely lacked internal resources. And Mm -hmm. it it is a great disconnect and great divide to know that we had achieved huge amounts of success and had every opportunity. That's no small thing. That's no small feat. My Mm -hmm. father was the son of a gas station owner. He came from Mm -hmm. nothing. He didn't even finish school and neither did my mom. So these are what we would call nowadays self-made people. And I don't want to diss wealth because I think it's an important thing. But I want to also point to the fact that in my case, it didn't provide the kind of inner security, a sense of wholeness. And then very early on, for whatever reason, I was like a conscious seeker. I was a seeker very early on. In fact, Mm -hmm. just today, I was looking through some old pictures and I saw myself at 20. I was already in India looking for Mm -hmm. a spiritual, not knowing it was a spiritual quest, but looking for something that my culture had seemed to have failed me. I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong, so Hong Kong is glitz and glam. The most wealthy people of China live in Hong Kong, along Mm -hmm. with an expatriate community, and it is a subculture of prosperity. Yeah. And so I had nowhere to turn other than around high school, I found three professors at my high school, an international school where there were three professors who taught religion and psychology mm. to me. And I broke away a little bit from my classmates and would go on hikes with these mm. guys, basically to a kind of apprenticeship myself to them and found a common bond with them. And there was not a sympathetic hierarchy. There was like mm. a, almost like a men's bond, like just we're mentors. And we were interested in the inner world. See, that's the thing. There was an interest in me, not in what I was doing and not what I had done and not what right. I had come but what I was experiencing. And that Mm -hmm. was the main shift. And there was an interest in what we would call now, you and I as therapists, a holding environment, a presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could see that I was in pain. I had so much shame. I had so much self-doubt. I felt insecure. I felt inadequate. At times I had suicidal thoughts. I had Mm -hmm. hopelessness. I had paralysis. I felt like I didn't measure up. And yet these men weren't like spoon feeding me anything. They were holding me really. There were some Joseph Campbell and notions of being on a journey. And and I remember one of the first books I received from one of these guys was Siddhartha, which Mm -hmm. is Herman Hesse's quintessential Mm -hmm. journey about the Buddha. And I also, that was my first inroad into Buddhism. One of them had given me a book on Buddhism. And another one had introduced me to holotropic breathwork, which was by Stan Groff. You might know Stan Groff. And, you know, Stan Groff is one of the early pioneers of transformational psychology. And okay transpersonal psychology, a whole movement that grew in California to an extension of like positive psychology, more into Mm -hmm. the flying spiritual principles into psychology. I'm 15. Remember, I'm 15. Yeah, wow. Like I don't really fit in and I don't like myself too much. Mm -hmm. And I I have self-harm behavior. And on the other side of it, like there are these, I would call them angels, you know, bodhisattvas, people that willing to take me by the hand and listen to me and get interested in me and give me shelter. It was refuge. And it was the early seeds that would set me off on a spiritual quest that not too many years later, I would find myself in India at 20. So I don't know Mm. if you have any other comments before we get to that phase of the journey, but I hear a lot of yeses. So there must be some synchronicity with your story, maybe. Well, for me, I, I almost think of it as like, I can't not seek personal growth and like understanding of self and understanding of others and the world around me. It's just like, I was born that way, (laughs) much to the dismay of my (laughs) parents in denial. But yeah, 
And it's just, I'm so envious of, of course, like my story is perfect the way it happened, but I'm still so envious of people who get this earlier in life. Like I wish I would have known about Buddhism as a child. And it's this fantasy that I could have saved myself some sort of suffering along mm. the way. But we know that's not true, but that's yes, the fantasy. Because exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there would have been something else, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. I found the path early, but did it really spare me? I mean, I look back and it was still hard. Come on. Yeah, who? Right. You're so young and impressionable. You know, I was in India. I found my way to a monastery in the town where the Buddha gained enlightenment called Budgaya. Mm -hmm. And I had joined a college abroad program that basically gave students an immersion into the monastic life. And so I was waking mm -hmm. up at 4 or 4.30 and doing meditation with the monks, the Burmese mm -hmm. monks there, and following a curricula of philosophical inquiry and meditation and service and living in a milieu where, I mean, it was like living in Mecca, essentially the Buddhist mm -hmm. the version of Mecca, where basically the entire village there is set up as a kind of enshrinement to the possibility of enlightenment, if you will. Mm. And so it involves great hardship to get there, actually. But Gaya is in Bihar, which is the poorest nation in, in all of India. And so mm. to get there, especially in the early 90s and even before yeah. that, before my time, was a huge commitment. And once there, it was a huge commitment. I remember just living in very, very bare bones and quality and standard. And I got dysentery three times in those six oh, months I lived God. there. <laughs> so I just want to paint that picture yeah. because I think some people overly glamorize the spiritual path. I like to debunk all of that. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. just like you said, I mean, even, you know, the romantic view is mm -hmm. misleading. It is yes. misleading. At the time, I was lonely, even though I was in India. I was away from a girlfriend that I loved. And six months when you're 20 is like an eternity. And <laughs> yes. so, you know, I remember looking at my diary from that time. And, mm. and even though I was in the midst of this spiritual thing, I was still heartbroken. I was mm. longing and yearning. The silver lining of that first tour in India at 20 was that I met a teacher. And of course, this is most people who are on a spiritual path end up meeting a teacher. This is one of the archetypes. That teacher, he wasn't a guru, let's say. He wasn't mm -hmm. out to gain followers. He wasn't mm -hmm. out for celebrity. He didn't teach on a big platform dais with hundreds of people. He was very chill. He was actually a librarian, mm -hmm. and he was well-read. Wow. He wasn't a monk. He was a layperson, and he mm -hmm. was from Sri Lanka. And I'll never forget him. His name was Godwin, and he really just had two teachings that he reiterated over and over and over again. And I think you and your listeners might really resonate with these two teachings. They were simplicity, uh, unadulterated. One was awareness mm. and one was kindness. Mm -hmm. And there was no hubris about him. He was the embodiment of these two things. There wasn't yeah. a spiel. There wasn't a deep philosophical text or treaties or commentary. There was short little talks and mostly hangouts where he embodied mm. presence and kindness. Yeah. And I think you could just riff on those two things because they end up being worlds onto themselves. The power of presence, I think, for mm -hmm. me was that it was something, despite everything I was afforded as a kid, the presence was missing. Right. Every, people's internal worlds were collapsed or wound up in around their own ambitions. Mm -hmm. And my father was an alcoholic, but he was also very narcissistic. And as a therapist, I think you probably have seen over your years how damaging it is to be raised mm -hmm. by a narcissistic parent because mm -hmm. we it, share that. <laughs> do we share that? I yeah, mean, my dad was a it's narcissist. So heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Isn't it heartbreaking? I mean, if you yeah. look back, I bet you concur with this or you agree with me on this. Like when you look back, the thing about narcissism is it's not that perceivable or detectable. It's not like right. people throwing plates across the room or mm -hmm. you know, narcissism is very subtle. It's very mm -hmm. subtle. It took mm -hmm. me years and years and years of therapy after the fact to recognize just how damaging that relationship was. Yeah. So these thoughts were not well formulated at the time, right. but mm -hmm. all I knew was it felt good and it felt safe mm -hmm. to be in Godwin's presence. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I had to compete for his attention. I didn't feel like I had to hide parts of myself. Mm -hmm. There were no shameful bits. I could just be as I am, warts and all. Unconditional love. Yeah. It's a little trite. No. I wish we could find words that weren't so pop culturally loaded, mm -hmm. but absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It was like a love that accepted all the shadow parts of me along with mm -hmm. the good parts of me. And then the kindness part, the aspect of the kindness was that not only was there recognition or awareness of the failures and the deficits and the demons and the hatreds, the amount of self-hatred and the insecurities, mm -hmm. 
but there was such tenderness. There was this quality of, it was like, I could just describe it like a salve. Mm, yeah. It wasn't just him recognizing. There was right, some right. way that he held it that actually soothed it, mm-hmm. like a salve, like a medicine. Mm-hmm. And it was so healing. And of course, some of these things, they come out in different ways. Like he had a lot of humor. I mean, can you imagine the power of humor and mm-hmm. lightheartedness? I mean, I was like a heavy stone at 14, 15, 16. Mm-hmm. There was no joy in me. He was always giggling and playing with the cats and like mm-hmm. making little games. And like, you know, he'd come up behind you with a little feather and tickle your ear. I mean, like oh, was, my gosh. Wow. Like little things. So then there was one day. I like to share this one day, again, not to make a sacred temple out of it, but to me, I think it is emblematic of the relationship. In a meditation environment, sometimes you have interviews, private interviews with the master, right? And mm-hmm. but I had gone to him because I had trouble sleeping and I had always had trouble sleeping. And I think it has to do with childhood traumas, I'm never feeling really safe. And as you know, yes. like the leftover residue mm-hmm. of hypervigilance yes. of never being safe means that you can never really fall asleep. Yes. Oof, we're late and hardcore. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're feeling me, right? Mm-hmm. So I went to him complaining of sleep and he said, well, why don't we talk for a little while? And then the hour got late and there were three beds in the room because it was a monastery, but there was no other guests there. So he said, well, sleep in the other bed. And he gave me these recommendations about how to sleep. And they, they had to do with recommendations that the Buddha gave about how to sleep on your side in a certain posture. And I did it and I slept that night. And I recount this in my recent book, Gradual Awakening, that I don't think it was it had any, anything fucking thing to do with the posture. Yeah. It had to do with his presence and his kindness and his mm-hmm. vibe. His vibe helped me sleep that night. But the beauty of the story is that the, in the morning we rose together before the sun. And we rose unprompted, maybe 4.30. Mm -hmm. And in silence, without asking each other, we made our way to a Mm -hmm. street, narrow path that led to the Tree of Enlightenment, where the Buddha sat down, actually. Mm -hmm. And we held hands. We held hands, which is very common in Indian culture and Mm -hmm. not so common in Western culture, as you know. But to me, it was so lovely. And there was no sticky bits about it. There was no, like, weird bits about it. It was just two people holding hands walking in the darkness to the tree of enlightenment. Mm. And when we got there, we sat down and it wasn't like we were sitting down for meditation. We were just sitting down together in quiet, taking in the whole scene. And once you get to the temple, of course, everybody's chanting. And so there were these beautiful chants that filled like an echo chamber, this tree of enlightenment. And Mm -hmm. we were just sitting there side by side. I describe it as like what I had always wanted. It wasn't a new Mm -hmm. toy some money in the bank account. It wasn't a trip to Greece. It wasn't any of those things. It was just as simple as presence and care, tenderness. They filled me. They transformed me right there and then under the tree. I knew Mm. that that was my path. I didn't know where it would lead. I just knew I wanted to follow it. That is amazing. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) I'm like tearing up over here. Just, I read a book recently about addiction as an attachment disorder and I was reading the part about how they talk about how unconditional love and like secure attachment actually changes the brain. And so that's what I'm hearing in this story. And and I'm also relating to I feel like my husband was the first person who unconditionally loved me and how I still tell him he saved me. (laughs) Absolutely. To really have someone be present with you. Yeah. If we don't have that as children, then we don't even like I didn't know how to tolerate it for a really long time. Yes. Look at how powerful something so simple can be. It saved you and I to receive it. But then think about when you don't think you have anything to give. Right. What's right underneath your nose that you can pretty much always give. I tell my students that too, when they are like, oh, I don't know these techniques and I don't know how to do this. Like just being present with a client is so, it's everything. It is everything. I mean, I think this is why the research shows that it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. what orientation you have. The alchemical process is the is the presence. Right. And he wasn't about teaching gimmicks and techniques. And I dare not call that meditation. I call it something else. I want to take it out of this kind of spiritual nomenclature and make it more accessible to people because I, mm-hmm. did, I think that the raw ingredients of what it was is is available to most of us. Mm-hmm. And once you get a little taste then and you are reminded that you have this inside of you, then it really can be available to anyone. Absolutely. And I want to go back to, you know, you talking about 
how Godwin wasn't looking for followers and he was just, he just happened to be a guy who had some wisdom. And before we started recording, we both kind of had this spark of like, <laughs> we're going to be authentic and this is not bullshit and being tired of seeing all the bullshit out there and a lot of like, you know, three steps to happiness and all that kind of shit that is, you said, a setup. And I totally agree with you. This whole like quick fix bullshit is killing people. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Like I was raised by a narcissist and my mother would always remind me how selfish I was. So I'm always writing this line of how do I hold my worth and show my worth? And I believe I have a good product. You know, how do I put that out there? Because I believe people are supposed to hear what I have to say. I feel like that's part of my calling. But at the same time, I don't want to appear narcissistic. I don't want to be selling something to people. How do you... <laughs> It's not a full question, but I think you understand what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think I resonated at the top with you because I have for a very long time have had more than misgivings about what I see in our culture. Yeah. And only recently with my book did I really articulate just how energetic I am about calling out the mm -hmm. narcissistic culture at large, yes. the narcissistic spiritual culture. We can talk about things like the law of attraction, for example, is my mm, new one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally think, and this may be, some of my hostility might come out, but you're a therapist, <laughs> so, so just point that out. Okay, gotcha. Okay, just like take care of my blind side yeah. here. We're live and rolling. But I think that there are some very genius marketeers out there that have mm -hmm. co-opted spirituality and have predator, like they're predators. Yes, yes. Because our Ugh. country and our society is very, very sick. Yes. And we are sick for a number of reasons, not the least of which is about 300 years ago in the Enlightenment, we abandoned our spiritual underpinning for yes. science. Yes. So oh, preach, preach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> so 300 years ago, we say, fuck you to religion because mm -hmm. we needed to. Okay. Religion had become an awful thing. It had burned people at the stakes. Mm -hmm. It had asked us to believe in blind faith. It had created wars and all in the name of God and was basically a corrupt culture. Okay, so we needed to get rid of religion and we needed science. I mean, science, right. all the breakthroughs and the developments of science from technology to the World Wide Web to medicine, all are part of the Enlightenment explosion. So there's no challenge to that. But there is a dark side, a shadow side of mm -hmm. jettisoning religion, which is that our spiritual values yep. and our connection with the unseen world of spirit and our connection with our bodies and our connection with mm -hmm. cycles of time and nature and song and the sacred has all been abandoned. And so flash forward 300 years and we are now a society that is 99.99% materialistic. Yes. And we think that we live one life. And so you better get yours. And mm -hmm. we think that a good life is spent is someone who works up the corporate ladder and gets a house and 3.5 children and a yep. white picket fence. And then that's it. And you better get it before you die. And yep. so it's more, 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 better, better, better. And fuck everybody else, essentially. And that's yep. why our ice caps are melting. And that's mm -hmm. why the Amazon is destroyed. And that's why all the last remaining spiritual cultures of the world hang on by thread, dental floss. Yes. And yet you can ask anybody in the so-called corporate modernity if they're happy. And behind closed doors, you and I receive these people who exactly. have vast amounts of wealth and they're popping Prozac. Yes. They're worried about their waist size. They're worried about their wrinkles. They're worried about how they'll be perceived. The recent scandal in the newspaper about kids going to college and how what we have to do mm -hmm. to get our kids in the best college is a symptom of this culture that basically they're insane. We are insane as a culture. Yes. But that's not the end point. That's, uh, you're resonating with that. But then there are these so-called self-proclaimed marketing gurus who mm -hmm. come along and say to a very sick culture who is anorexic spiritually, mm -hmm. who is starved spiritually, and who mm -hmm. has been spoon-fed from the last 50 years of advertising that if they buy the next product, they will feel happy. Mm -hmm. Now the spiritual marketers get on that bandwagon and they're selling spirituality in the same way. So just Google yep. some of the most top sellers right now, if you're listening to this. I won't name names because I'll start a war. But, 
Go and yeah. Google the top money makers and mm -hmm. go and see what products they're selling and what their pitch is. And it will be something like the laws of attraction. Okay. Right. The laws of attraction are if you learn to work with your mind and you have positive thoughts, you will bring to you all the things that your little narcissistic child yep. fantasizes about from health to wealth, to success, to popularity. You will be a celebrity. Your fortune 500 company will succeed. You will have a windfall of some, of some, mm -hmm. your heart's desire will be met. Now here's my question to any reasonable person listening in your experience. The mm -hmm. last time you had some amount of success or celebrity or fame or praise, how long did it last? Right. What would be any different if some marketing genius came up to you and said, just do your meditation practice and you can have that too. What will be the difference between the gains that you make from your meditation practice and the gains that you make on your commercial scramble on your treadmill to status and fame and fortune? Absolutely none. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is this is a predatorial yes. maneuver. Some of them are extremely big right now, like top three people in the world name wise mm -hmm. are part of this cabal of yeah. people that are interested in taking advantage of people and promoting some self aggrandizement in the guise of spirituality. And right. I think that that is so sad and I'm absolutely outraged by it. All I can do without getting personal is to make sure people understand that you're being had. Yes. This is yes. snake oil. True spirituality never props up and promotes that you're going to have everything that you've ever wanted. Exactly. No true, authentic, mm -hmm. spiritual lineage that has existed on this planet for more than Burning Man, for example, for Christ's sake. <laughs> We're talking about legitimate, not created by a few hokey pokey people in the desert, mm -hmm. thousands of years old. And that has a true authority like the Buddha, for example, mm -hmm. like Christ, for example. Okay. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the Christianity doctrines that have been co-opted by the big right. churches of the Midwest and, and some of their own propagandizing major machines in their huge churches. I'm talking about true spirituality with an authentic lineage has never promoted self-aggrandizement and the wishes of all your worldly fulfillments. They have right. never done that. They all say that the spiritual life is a bitch. It's hard. It's hard work. It takes a long time. It's incremental. You have to work it. And it's not about you. Yeah. It's only provisionally about you just enough, just enough to get your heart open and your head clear so that you can finally see that the true joy you've been looking for is about others. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to you, Sarah, when your husband yeah. gave you that boon. And when Godman gave me that boon, that's for life. Mm -hmm. But a windfall of payments or celebrity or getting your face on People Magazine or having another mm -hmm. 10,000 hits on Instagram, that doesn't last. In fact, it's right. worse than not lasting. Yes. It only gets you more agitated about when you're going to get the next hit and who's going to yes. look over your shoulder. And now that you have all this money, who's going to take it away? Right. Oh, my God. Who wants to live like that? Yeah. And that's why specifically I can speak from the addiction lens because that's generally what I work with. And it's people literally killing themselves, trying to keep up with some lifestyle, trying to attain this level of happiness that is just it's just not real. And, you know, we were joking today in this group that I did about like on your deathbed, you're not going to say, oh, man, I wish I had more money or I wish I was skinnier. You're going to mm -hmm. say, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. I was like, you guys, the secret to happiness is connection. So like, there you go. The secret of the universe. It's about connection to yourself and to others, like true connection to self. And that's what I hear you also talking about is this seeking for what's on the outside only creates disconnection from our true nature as well. Yeah. And it's deceiving. It's so simple what you're saying, right. but it's very deceiving, right? Because the little kid in me that was horribly depressed and wanted to off himself. I mean, if mm -hmm. you're going to say, have a connection with him in one way, there was plenty of connection with him. I hated him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was always with him and I would shut the door and I would shut out the world so that no one could see him. So I had plenty of connection with him, but I thought that he was the real me. Right. So now we're talking just nuancing it. The connection can just be reinforcing an old story or a mirage. The connection also needs what's called in the Buddhist tradition wisdom, which is some sort of seeing through. And maybe for us, you and I, Sarah, and others listening, that seeing through first happened when somebody else saw through. Oof. When those mentors yeah. didn't see me as the heavy kid, 
that was overweight or mm -hmm. the kid that had dyslexia and couldn't read out loud. It will make me cry just thinking about the shame mm -hmm. that I had to lie to my peers. And like, you know, when you used to read out loud in classrooms and you would each take a paragraph, mm -hmm. come around the room, guess what little Miles would do? He would get up and feign that he had to go to the bathroom. Wow. You know, so the level of shame to avoid the exposure Mm. was the person I thought I was. Right. And I had plenty of connection to that. Right. It took Godwin to see through. It took the mirror. Talk about mirroring. Yeah. My parent and your, was it your mother, your father, or both who was narcissistic, they're like, I describe them as a funhouse mirror. Yeah. One of those really warped, distorted mm -hmm. mirrors in which the child grows up and sees themselves in all kinds of distorted shapes yes. and sizes. And then you take that to be you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when your husband looked at you and Godwin looked at me, it was like seeing ourselves for the first time in the reflection of a clean mirror. Mm. Ooh, strumming my pain with his fingers. Oh, <laughs> but for real, it's, yeah, it's interesting that I think some of the lessons that I am being called to learn, like really fully learn now, it is all about trusting myself and not the funhouse version of myself that I got from my parents, but my real self. And it's so interesting how somehow I always say I must have like tricked my husband to marrying me because, <laughs> because he was so mm -hmm. healthy. So like I had this healthy attachment. And so I couldn't play that out in romantic relationships anymore, but I continue to play it out in either friendship or business relationships. And I've recently had an experience of this funhouse mirror again putting someone thinking they have the answers, putting it on them, and then them seeing me through the funhouse mirror and then finally recognizing like, wait, no, this is literally what happened in my family of origin. Mm. I've got to get back to the truth of myself. And this was a very expensive lesson. So I think I've learned it finally, <laughs> <laughs> like financially actually expensive, but it's just so true. That really struck me, the funhouse mirror. Yeah. And then there's, Society is also a mirror. So yeah. we create sub families and extend it into subcultures right. that are also our mirror. So, you know, right. like I'm worried about the kids of this generation. I mean, yes. they're because the way they're mirroring each other with the bullying and the mm -hmm. expectations mm -hmm. and, the, and the more the media. I mean, Instagram is a mirror. OK. And like mm -hmm. you and I both know the deleterious effects of Instagram, yes. young impressionable people when they start to see the status, celebrity, fame and fortune and hits of a million followers. What they yep. feel on the inside is their deficit. Yep. And now if you're scrolling for an hour or two per day, what you're essentially doing is hardwiring your brain to right. feel inadequate. Right. So then how do people compensate for inadequacy? Then they've got mm -hmm. a showboat mm -hmm. and compete. So now you have lift the vibration of a society. You have only reinforced everybody's insecurity, but now you have an amplification of the culture showboating. Right. Sickness on steroids. Yeah, it really is. And that's why there's so much noise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why you and I are so fucking pissed off. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, with the macro stuff, I tend to get overwhelmed and then just shut down. But it's funny because I've been, I just realized recently, I've been bypassing anger, like basically spiritually bypassing, not experiencing anger because it wasn't safe to feel mm. anger in my family of origin. And so I would just bypass it and I'm getting back in fucking touch with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would just go straight to hurt because it was safer to be a victim than it was to actually stand up. Mm -hmm. What was your turning point? <sighs> For figuring out the anger stuff or? Yeah. When did you finally give yourself permission? What was the light bulb moment? I mean, truly, this was just probably three weeks ago. Oh, oh I, congratulations. I had known that I had always bypassed anger and went straight to hurt, but I didn't think that it was affecting me, I guess. And I just, I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? I just don't do anger. But in the situation that recently happened where, you know, I was, again, being like asked to look in the funhouse mirror, then I started getting angry and it was working. I've been doing NARM neuroaffective relational model therapy with a new therapist. And as soon as she would like invite the anger into my body, it would like go away. It was so funny. And she's like, yeah, your anger is really shy. And That's so cool. I've been actually practicing when I meditate because it's just me and my anger. Nobody's watching. And letting myself actually feel it in my body. And you know what? I fucking like it. 
Mm. <laughs> it feels well, yeah. good. <laughs> it's interesting when it's just in the body, right? I mean, it's right. just energy, yes. right? It, it can be very constructive energy, like the currents in the water or behind a dam. Right. Think about what you could be using for that. I mean. Exactly. Right. And it's okay to have that. Yeah. We're nearly out of time. And I always want to ask these questions. And I'm very, very curious on your answer based on what we've been talking about. But shit, we're out of time, girl. With this, Almost. I'm just getting going, man. We're going to have to have talk. <laughs> I, well, clearly we're going to have to be best friends. And I'm going to come to New York, hang out with you and Scott Tusa, and we'll have a party. It'll be great. Oh, Scott Tusa, what an amazing right? man with a lot of integrity. Yeah. See, there are real true yes. teachers there, okay? And, and Scott is one of them. Yes. And I don't think you have to hide under a rock. Scott is on Instagram. I think we have to promote in our culture. Mm -hmm. My teacher, Geshe Tenzin Zopa, who is a Tibetan monk, brought me aside one day because he knows that my history of insecurity has made me very reluctant to self-promote. And he saw that I was very reticent to put my brand out there and put my courses and use the social media platforms that are available. He saw that and he said, listen, what's going to happen is that there are going to be a whole new generation of people that want true spirituality. And what they're going to find at the top of the Google search are mostly people that are mm -hmm. good marketers, but don't have the spiritual underpinning. Mm hmm and if you don't put yourself out there, you don't give someone an honest chance to get to something that has some integrity. Mm. And he said, I insist that you find your students and you have them help you put out a good brand that can compete with some of these wow. people that are actually, you know, because I won't name names again, but there are organizations in, yeah. that are touting Buddhist philosophy that are actually bankrolled by the Chinese government. Hmm. And so they have really nice shrine rooms and they have centers all over the planet and they are the top of Google and people who don't know any better and undiscerning. And why should they be discerning at that point in their spiritual mm -hmm. They wind up into those places? And so he said, you have to, you have to put yourself out there, but you always have to trust your integrity and it has to be integrity that leads. Yes. So when I hear the word Scott Tusa, I think integrity. So I'm glad that's the bridge that brought me to you. Yes. Anytime I hear of any Buddhist teacher, I always text him and like, is this person real or do they suck? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I asked him if you sucked and he said you did not. So this is why we're here. <laughs> oh, that's kind. That's kind. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Oh, man. But the two questions I always like to ask are, are you a healer and are you a wounded healer? And I'm curious how you fit with the word healer or don't. Am I a healer? Absolutely. Sure. Yes, of course. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I've been doing therapeutic work and teaching for, I'd say, at least 10 years as a teacher and as a therapist even longer. So, yes, mm -hmm. I mean, I have made my living and my main interest, even if there wasn't bread on the table, I would be doing this kind of work, working with people's minds. It has mm -hmm. shifted and morphed along the way, like I'm getting less entrenched in my individual work and now looking to expand mm -hmm. my offerings and more into teaching and more into groups and also more into hybrid modalities. Like I, I yeah. like to collaborate. I think we're in an interesting time where we are healing with new modalities. And I think that I've become keenly aware of the limits of psychotherapy, talk therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think the use of the body and the use of ritual and the use of community yes. and the use of pilgrimage and the use of meditation and the use of yoga. These are all things that interest me and they have taken me out of the office and into new ways of healing. So my horizon as a healer has definitely shifted of late. But I have always considered myself a healer. And so the second question is more interesting. Am I a wounded healer? I mean, I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are healers out there that wouldn't identify as wounded healers. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't, I'd have some suspicion about Right, that. right. <laughs> I don't know anybody worth their weight in salt who has something to offer that hasn't also been on the receiving end or on the downside. Right. Everything that I have to give has come hard by way of my own personal experience or mm. by way of the hard graft of working with people in the trenches of life. And I thank them all for their vulnerability and their courage and their fearlessness and their tenacity over mm -hmm. time to share with me their, their vulnerability and their story. I mean, sometimes I have thought to myself, I don't know if I could do what my clients do for me. I don't know if I could be right? that vulnerable as she was today, or I don't know if I could be as committed in the darkest hour yeah. as that person was today. So mm -hmm. in a way, we're foolish to think that we're healers in some hierarchy because right. there are so many lessons when our clients show us far more tenacity, far more vulnerability, far more self-love than we could ever show them. Absolutely. Whenever my therapist would 
say something like, oh, yeah, it's such an honor to work with you. And I'm like, yeah, whatever bullshit, you get paid, blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as I became a therapist, <laughs> really recognizing like that it's such an honor and it's such a teacher. Exactly like you said, I definitely have clients where I'm like, you're a fucking badass. And badass. I have learned so much from you. Yeah. And I'm really, really glad that you do identify with the word healer. I find that the folks who don't want to identify it, they don't want to identify it because when they think of the word healer, they're thinking of the snake oil salesman that we've been talking about this whole episode, and they don't want to identify with that. And the folks who often don't want to take on the term wounded healer have more of an issue of not wanting to live from their wounds. And so just that word, especially with like some spiritual wounding, people seem to bristle against that sometimes. But it's yeah. so interesting to ask the same question over and over and hear the same answer, but through different lenses. And think about it this way too, because once you're wounded, do you ever, and even if you heal, you would still be a wounded healer, wouldn't you? Right. That's what I think. Yeah. The trials and tribulations of your life that have brought you to where you are, even if you have overcome them, they are still part of you. And so that's how I see it. Yeah. I mean, I think these things, when we look back, once you have overcome addiction, once you have overcome a sexual compulsion, once mm -hmm. you have understood the funhouse mirror was never your fault, once you see through, you look back on your life and there are still these wounds that make you who you are, but now you're seeing them from a different vantage point. And now these are your assets. Right. And so from that point of view, those people that are still struggling, if you find a skilled therapist, healer, practitioner, or you find your way to your own Godwin, or you find your mm -hmm. way to your own path, eventually this is going to all make sense to you. I assure you of that. Yes. Your soul is looking to awaken. And it needs this friction and tension and distortion in order to do that. Yes. And that's what I think is so healing for me about just Buddhist philosophy in general is that dialectic of needing to go through the pain, needing to have the suffering in order to awaken. And that's what I try to tell all my clients, like, it's going to make sense later. And when I look back, it always does. It does. You have to be on a path, though. It's not mm -hmm. that the suffering in and of itself provides the wisdom. Right, right. It is the impetus. Yes, yes. And that tension combined with wisdom can really help you evolve. In a way, you can't get anywhere without it, but in a way, in and of itself, would just be a self-perpetuating misery. Right, which that was my mother's life. Yes. <laughs> Codependent, absolutely love to suffer, quite the martyr. That's, that's what that looks like. You know? And never really looking to venture into that to raise the vibration or raise right. the consciousness. Exactly. There are some people out there listening right now. I'm saying this because I think that where we are as a culture, I do believe that the more insanity there is out there and the more marketing gurus and the more ploys and the higher volume they are because they have bigger budgets. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are people who are awakening, legitimately awakening. Yes. And I'm not saying like rainbows coming out of their eyes. They're not enlightened. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that they are growing up. Right. And I think growing up is perfect for our culture. We need to mature and we need to discover that our narcissistic fantasies aren't what it's all about. But mm -hmm. we all also have incredible latent possibilities for purpose and meaning that I think have been very underplayed. Mm -hmm. I think this is a time for people to wake up to the fact that if they have a precious human life and resources, that they are really in a position to be of aid, support, assistance, and to, as you said earlier, to make a connection and yeah. to help make opportunities available for others. And this is what the purpose and the meaning of life is really about. And just mm -hmm. as there's a loud speaker of bullshit being trumped up around spiritual centers, there is also a growing number of people awakening that that is all a bunch of nonsense. And they're trying to connect mm -hmm. to a tried and true way of making sense of their world by way of authentic spiritual lineages, whether they be plant medicine and the shamans, whether it be Buddhism, mm -hmm. whether it be a real experiential Christianity, something like that, meditation, yoga, not the versions that promote self-aggrandizement. These are blossoming at a time just mm -hmm. at the same wave is crashing on them there's also a growing horizon. So I think they're co-emerging. Yeah, I agree. You know, there is so much bullshit on social media, but 
if you cultivate, <laughs> if you cultivate your feed mindfully, I follow like a bunch of witches and like crystal people and Buddhists and people doing some good work. And so I always find that on social media, I actually get some enlightenment and some lift and a higher vibration from that when I'm seeing things that are all I feel like aligned with authenticity and true purpose. And it's out there. Yeah. And you can curate your feed. And so that's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. You're making mm. self-selected choices. It's not the media itself. It's the consciousness that makes the choice. Right. So you make better choices. It could be food choices. It could be social media choices. It can be mm -hmm. exercise choices. It can be, you know, how you treat others, how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. These are all within our power. So that's a really nice metaphor. Mm. Well, one last question. When are we going to hang out? Because clearly we're vibing. <laughs> Well, listen, if you're ever in New York City, I just started a two-year program. Maybe mm. I can just share that yeah, with your please, please, listeners. Please. Okay? Yeah, Because it represents a turning point for me, mm. a movement away from being a therapist in a one-on-one -on -one situation to, and also leaving a community and leaving a center that I was part of mm. for 15 or 20 years of my life and, and moving out on my own, which took a heroic effort for me. Yeah. It was a real turning point. I was having a midlife crisis around 41, and now here I am at 43. I've made a full shift. The book has come out, Gradual Awakening, and then I went on a world tour and mm. I offered the proceeds of the book and the world tour to the nuns of Copan Nunnery mm. and then took a 30 of my students on pilgrimage to Nepal where I introduced them to an authentic master. I'm mm. not the master. I'm the bridge. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm the ferry boat man. <laughs> I carried people to an authentic lineage and we had a bang out time. And when we returned, we said, what's next? And so mm. what next has just emerged after three months of working with my team? I've created an online platform that showcases for two years the contemplative studies that is mm. drawn from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but articulated through contemporary psychology and neuroscience. Ugh, yes. It is a rigorous program. It involves a tremendous amount of time and energy, and it is for those people that are, on, as we just highlighted, on the cusp there. They're kind of sick of the noise. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do just a one-on-one -on -one meditation workshop. They're looking to get stuck in, as they say in the UK. They, they want to do the hard graft, mm. which is to get stuck in for two years, do meditation workshops, do uh, live stream courses. Everything is available on the cloud for those days when you have kids or you can't make it meditations, lectures, pilgrimages to Sri Lanka and Tibet to meet mm. the masters, all available in the cloud. And I'm very proud of it. And what wow. it shows me is that it is reinforcing of a vision that I had a very long time ago, that once you get over the insecurity mm. and you master your power, you can create. And what are you creating? Are you creating something for yourself? Or are you creating yes. something for others? Yes. And this program is for others because I can already mm -hmm. see in three months uh, over 100 people from 10 countries signed up. And I don't have a big list and I'm not a big self promoter, but I listened to my teacher and I went for it. And this is the manifestation. It's called the Contemplative Studies Program. You can find information about it at gradualpath.com. And it is an anytime evergreen program that you can join if you are mm -hmm. sort of done your one week, one book workshop, and you're looking for the longer ride of an mm. authentic tradition, I'm happy to guide you along that and to give you the tools and skills you need to actually take responsibility for your life so that you can mm -hmm. put yourself in a position to be of service to others. So thank you for that little moment. I'm oh, happy yeah. to share that because I feel proud about it. And yeah. remember, we started the whole conversation with how insecure I feel. So I just want right. to also own the fact that sometimes I can also have healthy pride. And truthfully, it's a really good model for me because like I said at the beginning, it is something I struggle with too, how to walk that line. And I keep going back to the idea of as long as I continue to lead with gratitude, that's probably the best way to keep myself humble is recognizing like, yes, I'm doing the things I want to do with my life and I have to promote myself in order to continue doing them. And I'm so grateful. Mm. And I heard that just in the vibration of what you were sharing. So. You're the real deal, dude. Thank you very much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Anything else that you want to share that we didn't talk about? Just I do also believe that these connections like through Scott Tusa, this is a growing network, you know, and yeah. I think none of us are going to drown out the noise individually. I think mm. having these kinds of conversations, if people are listening that are in a really tough bind, know mm -hmm. that it's possible to get yourself out of it mm -hmm. find the right kind of people, find the right kind of programs. 
just as there are, you know, ones that are going to mislead you, there are also going to be ones that legitimately empower you. And there is a network of people that are growing that have some integrity. They do have to pay their bills. They do want to raise families. They do have to live in a capitalistic society. Right. But they are coming from a good place. And mm -hmm. I think don't only listen to what's being sold or said, but look at the behaviors and do a little yes. homework. Yes. And trust your vibe. Yes. The vibe is so important. What does your gut say about this person? Mm-hmm. Amen. Rocket. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciated this conversation. All the best to you and all the podcasts that you have done. What an amazing service that you're doing to your listeners and all the podcasts that you will do. May it benefit all those people, yourself included, your family. And I wish all the best for all of your listeners. All the best for you. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much for joining me today. Oh, wasn't that a great conversation? I hope that you're feeling all buzzy and excited too since you've listened to it. If you want to find out more about Dr. Neil, you can visit our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. <laughs> Thanks as always to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.